Hello, thank you very much for having me. Um, as a user of the web, I really like uh, going to websites that load fast, and I can do what I wanted to do very fast and leave. I hate waiting for everything to be loading. Um, but at the same time, as a developer, it's always a struggle trying to manage all the assets that you need in order to compose the, the page, like all the CSS, JavaScript, and all the images. So um, during this talk, I'm going to be talking about images and how I think they are um, the culprit of some of the performance issues that we see nowadays and what things we can do in order to change that. Um, yeah, so images on the web, they represent a very big chunk. They're, they are like around two thirds of the bytes that we send down the wire. So take your CSS, JavaScript, put everything together, videos, doesn't matter. It will still be smaller than images. Um, but of course, we need to use images. Uh, it would be really easy for me to just leave states and say, don't use any image. But that's not how it works. Speaking of working. Yeah. So yeah, we do need to use images. We need to uh, transmit some feeling. And images are re really great for that. Uh, but in some cases, we can stop. And whenever we try to add an image, maybe we can wonder if it's really needed there. Um, we've been using images for a long time. Um, not that long ago, we were using images for uh, creating border radius. And, shadows and gradients, and that's not needed anymore. So think it twice when, when we are adding an image. There's this trend of um, minimalistic design or flat design that we see nowadays, and it's not something that comes as a surprise. We need to support lots of different devices with uh, different DPIs, and having relying on these kind of images, uh, vector images, will provide us with uh, like support for free. We don't need to uh, wonder how many versions of a certain image we need to generate. It, it just works. We just send an SVG, and it will work. And also, these SVG files are highly compressible, because they are just text. So maybe it's a technique that we can embrace. Of course, you will always need some bitmap images. And with bitmap, I don't mean BMP. Uh, like JPEGs or PNGs for some imagery. In my case, I'm going to show a specific example on Spotify. So I was working on this page. It's a very simple one. Um, it's a page for a track by Adele. And there's a background image there and the header, like a hero image that we display. And it looks kind of fine. It complements the rest of the, of the element. Uh, but this is a responsive site. So what happens when we shrink the, the screen and we see it on mobile? OK, so the background image doesn't really provide any value there. So what's, what's the point in showing that? So maybe in some cases, we can hide the image. We can just avoid it altogether. So think it twice, because there are many use cases in which we can save um, a request for an image. And someone can say, OK, uh, let's use a media query and hide the image. You can do something like this, in which we have this sample image for the background, and then we use a media query, and we set display none. The problem with this is that the browser doesn't really care about the CSS. The browser is going to parse the HTML, it will see that image tab, and it will make the request to the image. So even, even if we are hiding it using CSS, the browser will still request it. So for this, a uh, better way would be to set that uh, image using CSS, exactly the same thing that we use to hide it. Another case would be something like this. This is like old way to do stuff where we maybe we printed all the HTML that we needed, and then we used some JavaScript to uh, show and hide different pieces. In this case, this section here, it contains a request for an image. And even if it's hidden by that class, it will still request the example too. So these days, uh, most of us are using some kind of library, a component library. I don't want to say React, but yeah, React or whatever um, to handle this. So in the DOM, you will only see, you will only get the really the markup that is needed. Uh, yeah. So have a, um, a thought of um, 
when you are adding an image and how you can prevent that request. Then optimize your images. Um, this, this only benefits uh, by optimizing images, and it's, it's really easy. And normally, we can talk about good techniques that involve some bad part no one wants to talk about. Optimization is really good. There's, there's no really impact. There's no problem. Maybe your um, build script will take a bit longer, but you can always commit those optimized files, and you don't need to optimize every time you make a change on the rest of the site. So really, optimize them. We have lots of tools that we can use. I normally use JPEG Optim, but there are many, many other tools. And there are new JPEG encoders, for instance, coming out every day. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Google presented their own. And for a long time, Mozilla had uh, another JPEG encoder that promises to uh, get better results, better encoding. And lots of these tools are popping out every day using um, similarity structure. So instead of just setting a certain compression level, it will generate several images, and then it will compare them visually. So you always get the high, highest savings with the uh, lowest file size. Then we have um, responsive images. And this is something that I was looking forward for a long time. We, at last, we have some standard that we can use in order to uh, make the browser do the hard job about choosing one or the other image. This is great. Um, uh, you should use it. However, I don't see that many people using it. And myself, uh, working on a couple of projects, I've been trying to give it a try, and I always have some issues. And I'm going to explain this is my personal view on a couple of things that I don't like. First of all is the markup. Um, it can become a bit messy. At first sight, it's, it's a bit difficult to understand exactly what's going on and what images are going to be requested where. Uh, but sizes being a list of breakpoints makes your breakpoints live both in the HTML and the CSS. So unless you really keep track of all the changes and you make sure that they are in sync, it's very easy to make a change in CSS and then forget about uh, the HTML. So here we are coupling a bit, uh, because the browser needs to know this information. The browser, as, as we saw before, is not going to wait until the CSS is loaded in order to decide what image is being requested. Second issue is not a problem in responsive images, per se, um, but we don't have any standard way of doing lazy loading. So I would really like to be able to, uh, for browsers to, to see the viewport and make sure that they are not requesting the things that are below the, the viewport if they are not needed. But we don't have any standard way. So we will see how lots of people are coming up with different ideas on how to solve this. Um, the, thing I've, the way I've seen working the best is some, some kind of hybrid. Uh, this is an example of a Spotify page that we serve to mobile. So the content that you think that is going to be above the fold, there you use some regular image or responsive images. Then the content that is going to be below the fold, you do lazy load those images. So this, is for, this is an example of a page for an artist. And this would be uh, artworks for their albums. It doesn't make sense that we request all of this when most users will only see that, and actually we click the green call to action. And there are a couple of ways that we can do lazy loading. Uh, the basic approach is to, for all images, check if they are uh, within the viewport. And then if they are, we, we just request that. Problem is that we need to do this check every time we scroll, or we resize, because we can also change the layout uh, when resizing. And those checks, they don't come for free. You need to, like every time you ask for the dimensions and the position of an element, it's going to trigger some recalculations of the layout in the browser. So if you try to implement lazy loading as a way to improve performance, you might actually end up uh, hardening performance and in adding some stuttering when the user scrolls. So be sure that you. Uh, try to uh, try to include some checks so you don't perform these checks very often. 
And there's this intersection observer API that I'm really excited about. And it's very recent, and it can help out solving this problem. So instead of binding to this on scroll or on resize event, what you do is that you subscribe to an event that is triggered when that image makes it to the viewport. And you can also say, if this image is uh, 100 pixels uh, close to the viewport, so it's not yet in the viewport, but it's close enough, uh, request it. And it's supported on Chrome and Opera. That's uh, Blink. And it's under development in Firefox and Edge. So the thing is that you can use this. And you can always provide some, either use a polyfill or implement the old way to lazy load content. It's very easy to come up with a wrapper. And the way it works, it's going to be easier if we see it here. Um, there, we will get events both when that uh, green square is within the, this external body or even within the scrollable div. So it's really useful. Now, this is a small problem. So when we request an image, we don't really know what to show while we are waiting for the image. That's not normally a problem. But if we start adding lazy loading, this will occur more often, uh, because there will be some cases in which the user scrolls, and then they don't see anything. So the question is, what can we show while the image is loading? And here there are several alternatives. Um, the easiest one is to not do anything at all. So ideally, what you would do is to still keep the area. So uh, when the image comes, everything is in the same place. It doesn't push the content below. Then the second option is to use some kind of placeholder. You can use an SVG for this. And this is useful, for instance, if you are displaying a profile image and the user didn't set any profile image. Or maybe the request to fetch the profile image fails. And now the more uh, fun ones, um, at least from my point of view, you can use a solid color. And you can actually uh, use libraries in order to fetch different colors that you, that you can use given an image. So they will give you maybe the um, more frequent uh, color, or maybe the one that is closer to the edges of the image. And then the last one is using some blurry image that at some point it will be transitioned to the full image. So I'm going to show some examples of sites using these two, the rightmost ones. So this example is Google Chrome. Uh, and they have an option that in some slow networks, you see this button that you can click on it, you can tap on it, and then it loads the images. So by default, it doesn't load them. And it replaces them with um, one of the colors from the image. So again, this normally you only realize about these things when you are using a very slow network, or if you are on a plane and you are using the Wi-Fi from the plane. Actually, that's how I started investigating this. Google also has some other examples of this. So this is a website, which is called Arts and Culture, and it's used to browse uh, content from museums. And again, we see these placeholders. And they are nice because they, they give feedback to the user. You know, as a user, that there's something going on, that there's a request, that at some point there will be an image, and it's going to take that area. So it's really useful as a hint. But you don't need to go to this um, maybe hidden uh, arts and culture site. You can just uh, search for images. This example is, uh, is using a throttle connection, so we can appreciate more this effect. And here I'm basically advertising Spotify because I'm working there. But you see, you see this. Actually, the colors are different from the previous example, so they, are, they have even different implementations. Now, I want to show you some examples of what I call progressive image loading. And this is the one in which we see the blurry image um, being transformed into the final image. This example is taken from Medium, where maybe you've seen that effect before. Uh, some people call it blur up technique. 
But the basic idea is that you start with a very tiny image that it's uh, stretched and then blurred. And from there, you migrate, I mean, you transition to the final image. And recording uh, this timeline, we can see how it goes. And let's see how they implemented it, because this is the magic of uh, web. We can always right click and just see what's going on. So first they use a div to render the image, then they request a small image, then they draw the image to a canvas and apply a blur effect. Then they request the large image, they render the large image, and they hide the image. So not really straightforward. There are several things that you can do. If you are thinking of implementing something like that, uh, you can apply a blur effect to canvas, but you can also use SVG filters. There's a blur effect for SVG, and also CSS3. Now, this is what the markup looks like. So as I say, it's not really straightforward. Uh, good things is that, well, the interesting thing is that the image that they use is really small, like 27 uh, times 17. And there's a no script fallback in case the browser doesn't handle JavaScript. And we're talking this morning about users and putting users first. So these techniques, the goal is to try to improve the user user's perceived performance. But they can also uh, backfire at some point. So I was trying to find out if there was some kind of feedback from users. And I managed to find some tweets. Um, these are positive ones, looks nice, uh, loads very fast. Some people find it distracting. Some people find it slow. And the thing is that this is really subjective. We think that the user is going to like the effect. And normally, it's, it's very smooth. And uh, it's really nice when it works. But it can, it can be a problem if it doesn't load. <coughs> and the thing is that we have had something similar to this for a long time. We have had progressive JPEGs, in which just given a small amount of bytes from the image, we can already draw the whole area even though it's pixelated. But still, um, people can find it difficult to uh, uh, follow what's going on. And in some cases, it looks like you have to do more work. And actually, only 7% of the images, of the JPEG images on the web, are progressive ones. And in some cases, this is not even reliable. And it can backfire if the request for the second image fails. So. Um, they are, it's a very tiny, it says, if you are viewing this on desktop and the above image looks like a bit blurry, please refresh the page. So that's a sentence from a post on Medium um, as a workaround to fix this, just reload the page. So this is about putting users first or, um, or not, but sometimes we try to put users first and then we, we break it. This idea of using small image and then request a large image has been done several times before. Uh, there's one which is very creative. Uh, that's Facebook. They decided for slow networks for the mobile client. They wanted to fetch the profile image, including already some, uh, some small image in it. So the idea was that. In the initial JSON for the information of the page, you already have some information for the image, so you can render something without waiting for a second request to fetch the big image. They were doing some experimentation with it, and they came up with um, a 200 byte payload as uh, the maximum size for an image to make sense for their technique. The problem is that. <coughs> In JPEG, only the headers of the JPEG are greater than 200 bytes. So you cannot use JPEG for this if you really want to get a super tiny image. So what they did, because they are big and they have a bunch of people working on this stuff, was they came up with a common header for all the images, which they included in the client. And then they only downloaded 
the data that changed, the data that composed the JPEG and excluded the headers. And that's what they serve using the GraphQL. And this is super creative, and it's great. <laughs> um, but sometimes we don't need to overcomplicate things. Uh, there are new formats also coming. And I was giving a try to this, and I said, OK, I'm going to try to compose very, very small images. And I generated these tiny thumbnails, and they were 42 by 42, exactly the same size as the ones used by Facebook. And this is the size that I managed to, fa to achieve using JPEG. And I tried to use PNG and GIF to see just how well they could encode very small images. And at some point, I've, I tried with WebP, and then I realized that WebP is really good at this. So you can have a very small image, and you compress it with the highest level, and you get images that are roughly 25% of the size. And one could say that, yeah, maybe they don't look exactly the same, but take into account that these images are going to be scaled and blurred. And once we blur them, they pretty much look the same. Then when I was experimenting with this, I thought, yeah, I really like SVGs. Um, can we do something with SVGs instead? I don't know if you've seen this site. It's a review for PlayStation, for PlayStation 4. There was another one for Xbox One. And I found it super interesting, this effect, this drawing effect. It's kind of fun. It's just, it's an SVG. And the way it works, let's see. OK. The way it works is you create the SVG, and then you need to animate two properties related with the stroke. And I thought, OK, maybe I can use something like this in order to preload an image. So I had a look at this canny edge detector. I wanted to find out a way to vectorize the image. And yeah, I, I found this on Wikipedia, and then I started trying it out. And then I, so I thought, yeah, let's give it a try. Maybe we can generate SVGs that we serve in line. And then we start animating them while we fetch the big image. And the effect is kind of cool. I don't know how useful it would be and if someone will ever implement this. I was actually planning to do some hack uh, for Spotify, but then I thought, yeah, maybe labels won't like that I'm messing around with the images. So. The way this works is you find the edges, you create SVG lines, and then you animate them using JavaScript. Uh, in my case, I chose polylines. So this is a set of points, and then it will draw lines across all those points. But you can also use paths. So the question is, should we do this? Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I see people using JavaScript for creating lots of stuff, like terminals. You can use hyperterminal. Your code editor can be built using JavaScript. I've seen some operating systems written in JavaScript. I think that if you can do it, uh, I mean, if someone, if it's possible, then someone will do it. I think, all in all, it's something fun, and it's it's interesting that we try out these techniques, and we we try to push uh, what we know and learn from each other. So as a summary, uh, when dealing with trying to improve the performance, have a look at the images. Uh, try to reduce the amount of requests. Uh, make sure that you choose the right format and optimize them. Um, implement responsive images and try to lazy load them. And finally, if you have some time, try to innovate and go crazy. I think my, my main message here is that the web is fun. And this thing about right-clicking and seeing what people are doing, I haven't seen that in some other platforms. It's really nice that we can see the code, and we can just set breakpoints here and there and, and debug it. I find it super, super useful. And I don't know how people do it with Android and iOS. I doubt they have access to, to the code that is shipped. So let's take advantage of this. Um, let's, let's continue going crazy and sharing our learnings. Um, yes, 
Um, <laughs> we are always looking for web devs. If someone is interested, please come in and talk to me. It's very dark in Sweden right now, uh, but it's going to get better soon. And that was my talk. Thank you very much.